<laughs> Good morning and welcome back to orchestra. I am so glad to see all of you this morning. You'll notice on RenWeb that I say that I'm in a Zoom chat right now. That's true if you want to actually come and talk to me after this video because you're confused or you're not sure what's going on. That's totally fine. The Zoom code and the password are both on RenWeb. Some things we need to talk about before we actually start the orchestra stuff. First, every week there's a recorded assessment due. That's been true since the beginning of this madness. The recorded assessment is always due the week after it's assigned. There's a reason for that, so that you can practice it. I'm not assigning it and expecting it by the end of the period because I don't expect you to have already practiced the excerpt preemptively. So it's always due the week after. From now on, I'm expecting them to actually to be due on time. You can turn them in ahead of time, some of you do that, and that's totally okay, but I do expect them by the end of the next Friday's class. I hope that makes sense. We are going to wipe the slate clean, so if you're missing orchestra recordings, I'm not putting zeros in for them. I'm counting the people who's turned them in as a boost to their grade. So if you've turned it in, it's helping your grade out, that's awesome. If you haven't turned it in, I'm not gonna put zeros in because it seems like there was some confusion and some difficulty getting things recorded. But going forward, you do have to record things. So pay attention to RunWeb. If you have questions, please let me know. I sit here all day, every day. I've got time to answer your questions. Okay, today. We're going to go back to the basics with some music theory stuff. I noted some trends in your compositions that made me aware that there's just some gaps in our knowledge base. We're missing some puzzle pieces. So I want to go back and really cover the beginning of music theory, the basics of music theory. For some of you guys, this is going to be redundant and repetitive, but it's good practice. Music theory is a lot like math. Um, it's good to practice basic skills because everything builds on itself. Computation leads to algebra, which leads to calculus. Basic chord analysis eventually leads to counterpoint. But you have to practice the basic skills. So here we go. I want to first tell you that if I say a definition, it probably came from this book, Tonal Harmony. Um, but I'm also referencing things from these three books. Okay, music theory is the language we use to explain why and how music works. Like I said, it's kind of like math. Science is exploring why the world works and math gives it the language to do that. Music theory is the same way. It gives us the language to explain why music functions the way it does, why it exists in the context it does. Um, there are some basic ideas you have to understand before we even start to talk about music theory. And the biggest one is just harmony. Western music, in general, puts a really large emphasis on harmony. It's rather, um, oh, nope, that doesn't make sense. It's larger than in other cultures. In Eastern culture, they would put a bigger emphasis on melodic variation or potentially rhythmic complexity, but we really emphasize harmony above all else. Most things that you listen to have more than one part. They have two things going on or three things going on or more. That's why when we study music theory in Western cultures, we put a huge emphasis on harmony, specifically on tonal harmony. Before I get there, I want to make sure we all are aware. Harmony is the vertical aspects of music theory or of music. Melody is horizontal. Melody moves this way, forward in time, whereas harmony stacks on itself together at the same time stacked vertically. Those two things are related to each other and their relationships change over time and in history they've been different, but we study tonal harmony. Look at that segue. Tonal harmony came about in the common practice era. This is the era between 1650 and it kind of sort of ended in 1900 formally but most things are based on itself. So the common practice era included people like Bach and Mozart and Beethoven and Haydn, basically all the people I make you listen to in choir. All of those people wrote music during the common practice era. This era is super important because it informs everything that comes after it. Even the things that are a direct reaction against tonal harmony in the common practice era exist because of the common practice era and tonal harmony. Also, 
tonal harmony continues to exist today. If you listen to a pop song or a country song or a worship song or a hymn or any such thing, it's based in tonal harmony. Harmony has the primary, tonal harmony, sorry. Tonal harmony has the primary influence on those pieces or songs. Tonal harmony has a couple of characteristics that are really important. The first one is that it has a tonal center. I talked about this when I talked about you writing your melody. A tonal center is a home note, the pitch you always come back to. In our solfege scale, it's Do. If I'm in the key of C, it is C. It's really important that you have a tonal center when you write with tonal harmony, because otherwise it's not tonal. Wow, crazy. Hmm, yep. That's the first thing. Tonal center, really important. The second thing is that Western tonal harmony is based primarily on major and minor scales. There are other scales that exist. That was just a minor scale. Right, there's other scales that exist, but we base most of our music on just major and minor scales. Major and minor scales are a very specific pattern. They move very specifically. Another characteristic of tonal harmony is that it's primarily based on tertian chords. That's a crazy word. Tertian, it's T-E-R-T-I-A-N. Tertian just means thirds. It's based on chords that are made up of thirds. We'll talk eventually about what a third is very specifically, but for those of you who already know, this chord is made up of thirds. If I stacked it further, it's still made up of thirds. is based on chords made up of thirds. Tertian harmony. Hooray! And the last thing is functional harmony. Chords and scale degrees and notes in functional harmony have a function. <laughs> so the notes relate to each other in fairly complex ways that we'll explore later as we go on. Not today, but in general we're going to explore them. And each of them reacts differently to each other. I also talked about this when we started our melody, but some of us were confused, and understandably, we hadn't really talked about it in class before. So, for example, if I played this chord, even more, yeah, it has a very specific feel to it, and even without studying functional harmony, because you live in Western culture, you can feel where this chord wants to go. It wants to go here. different notes in functional harmony relate to each other in different ways. So, tonal harmony, to recap. Tonal harmony has a couple of characteristics. It was created during the Common Practice era. It has a ton tonal center, sorry, it has a tonal center. It has major and minor scales as its primary harmonic basis. It uses tertian chords and it makes use of functional harmony. Okay, today we are going to talk specifically about pitch, elements of pitch, keys and key signatures. So pitch, all are on the same page. Pitch is the highness or lowness of a sound. Things other than musical instruments have pitch. If you move your finger around a wine glass, it makes a specific pitch, either high or low. On the keyboard, things that are on the top are high, things that are on the bottom are low. On the staff, things that are high are high and things that are low are low. Most music is based around, most piano music, sorry, is based around middle C. Middle C is the middle C on the keyboard. If you search for the C that's closest to the center, you're going to find it here in the middle, and this is called C4. We use octave designations to tell us which C I'm talking about. You can also look at the staff and see what C4 looks like. Um, C4 is here. An octave, this is the next building block, an octave is the span between one C and the next C. Between one C and the next C. Up or down. Or between this E and the next E. Basically, it's from one letter name to the next letter name. Um, we use seven letter names. I'm just going to make sure we all are on the same page. Seven letter names to name our pitches. A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, and then it repeats. Yes? Good. Lawfully. 
um, C to sign it shining C, that's an octave. We call all of the notes that are within that octave from the first C up to the next C, but not including it, an octave register. They all have the same number, C4, D4, E4, F4, G4, A4, B4, and then this is C5. We increase as we go up. There you go, fun things. The staff functions as a graph. It kind of actually functions like an X, Y axis where X is time and Y is pitch. So if it's higher on the graph, it's going to be higher in pitch. The further out it is on the graph, the further out in time it happens. For example, let's say that I have a note here and I have a note way over here. It would happen something like this and then this over here. Yeah, so it moves across linearly, but also functions horizontally. Here we go, good stuff. Uh, oh, something that's important to talk about, the clef. The clef is not something you can leave off of your piece of music because the clef actually gives meaning to the staff. Without a clef, we have no idea what those five lines and four spaces mean. The clef tells us which letters to assign to which spaces and which lines. The treble clef has a different set than the bass clef does. There are also other clefs. There's the alto clef and the tenor clef. And sometimes there's an octave tenor clef. We've actually seen that in choir, I think once. Um, but we're not gonna mess with alto tenor. We're not gonna mess with the tenor octave clef. We're gonna primarily deal with treble and bass. Most instruments play treble bass. The piano, uses something called the grand staff. We've talked about this. You guys did a music theory worksheet where you had to draw the grand staff. The grand staff is two staves or two staffs hooked together with a brace. The brace is important. It's what differentiates the grand staff from other staves or staves that are hooked together. So you do actually need the brace. Um, let's move on. Staff, pitch, major scales. That's where we are. Here we are. A major scale is a specific pattern of whole steps and half steps. Half steps are the smallest distance you can travel on the piano. Um, the smallest space is usually between a white key and a black key, although there are some instances where it's a white key to a white key and a white key to a white key. A whole step is two half steps combined together, if that makes sense. We've got, so from C to D is going to be a whole step. From C to C sharp is a half step. A major scale is the same pattern every single time. Every single time, no matter what. If it doesn't follow this pattern, it is not a major scale. It's going to be a whole step. So C to D, a whole step, half step, a whole step, whole step, whole step, and then a half step. So Every single time, no matter what. Major scales, whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. Accidentals are those symbols that change the pitch up or down for us. You'll find that if you start the major scale on a different note, say G, you can't play F. It's not correct. That is not a whole step. You need a whole step there. So to make this happen, we play F sharp. There are five different kinds of accidentals. I know, mind explosions. You only mostly see three of them. There are five. The middle one is the natural sign. The natural sign means you play the pitch as written, like the normal old A. A natural is just A. Then there are flats, which lower the pitch a half step. So if I'm on A and I see an A flat, it's down one. There are sharps that raises the pitch a half step. We go from A to A sharp. Then there are these lovely doodads. There is the X looking thing. That's a double sharp. The double sharp raises a pitch a whole step. So if I'm on A and I've got a double sharp, I'm going up to B. And then last but not least, we've got the double flat. The double flat lowers the pitch by a whole step. If I'm on A, I go down to G. So we've got double sharps, sharps, naturals, flats, double flats. These are really important when you're writing your scale because you cannot write the same letter name twice in a scale. 
you must use all seven plus one, all seven letters in your scale on the way up and on the way down. You have to include all seven. This is because it gets wildly confusing if you start to mash accidentals in there. It's much more efficient if you use all seven letter names. It is not correct for you to write this note as a G flat. It's just not correct. It's going to be marked wrong. So please make sure when you're writing your scales on your worksheet that you use all of the notes, all of them. All of them, yes. Even though G flat and F sharp sound the same, they are actually, strangely enough, not the same. They function differently in music. That's a whole debate for another time. We're not gonna go there right now. The next thing we're gonna talk about is key signatures. Key signatures eliminate the need for us to use accidentals throughout a whole piece. This is something that would be so helpful for you all while you're writing your compositions. A lot of you went through and you wrote accidentals in every single time a note was going to be flat or sharp or whatever. Um, key signatures eliminate a lot of confusion. They actually help you to know which note is your tonal center and they help you to know which notes are sharp and flat. It's a great time. So key signatures follow a pattern. They follow a pattern of sharps and they follow a pattern of flats. And because of that, it's very easy for us to identify which key we're in. There are two tricks. There's a trick for sharps and a trick for flats. For sharps, you go to the last sharp on the key signature and you go up a half step. So for example, if the final sharp on the key signature was F and you went up a half step, it would be G. Yes? yes. Okay. Um, for flats, you go to the next to last flat, and that is the key you're in, except for in the key of F, the key of F is the only one that's weird. It's got one flat B flat. Everything else, you go to the second to last flat, and that's the key you're in. For example, the key of B flat has two flats, B flat and E flat. E flat's the last flat, B flat is the first flat, and it is the key that you are in. The last couple of things we need to talk about. There are enharmonic keys and enharmonic notes. I pointed this out when I was talking about G flat and F sharp, notes that sound the same that aren't. This is also true of keys. I can play a C sharp major scale and a D flat major scale. And they are the same. They sound exactly the same as each other, weirdly enough. Um, there are, I think, three and or six, however you want to think about it, keys that work that way. The last thing, really quickly, is that the placement on the staff matters. So when you're writing key signatures, you cannot just write sharps and flats wherever you feel like writing them. They have to follow the pattern. For flats, the pattern always goes B flat. Yes, my gosh, my brain. The pattern always goes B flat, E flat, A flat, D flat, G flat, C flat, F flat, B E A D, G C F, bead. Greatest common factor. And then for sharps, it's just, for sharps, it's just the reverse. You go F, C, G, D, A, E, B. You follow this pattern every time. Pay attention to which of those notes is marked. It moves in a really lovely down, up, down, up, down pattern. It's kind of a zigzag. Pay attention to it because it does matter. If you mark the wrong ones, they aren't correct. Very confusing. It's like if in math, all of a sudden, someone started drawing their twos backwards all the time, people'd be confused. Same thing with musicians. If you start drawing your key signatures out of order, people are gonna be like, what are you doing? The final thing the talk, the, this chapter talks about is the circle of fifths. I'm not gonna go into that today. We did talk about it a little bit last year. If you're interested, there's a ton of YouTube videos about the circle of fifths. It's actually kind of cool, um, but we do not have time to talk about it today. So. In RunWeb, you will find a link to a worksheet. You have to print it out, or if you have some sort of capability to write on it, I guess that's fine. Um, please use pencil. It's, again, like math. You'll probably make mistakes, and it's easier to correct them if you can erase them. You are not turning this assignment in, but you are coming to a Run, or a run web session, a Zoom session at the end of class, where I will check your work. I'm just going to look and see if you did it, and then we're going to go over some of the problems so that you can kind of understand what went wrong or what you did correctly. So don't fail to do it. Make sure you do it. Come to class prepared, and I will see you all in a Zoom call session later. Goodbye. Go forth and do the great things.